Short, bold, and angry. My dreams, my dreams, my dreams. You sometimes dreams, find that dreams, dreams get in the dreams, way of your dream. Dreams, get out of here. Dreams blocking dreams. Dreams preventing my dreams from dreaming. Get out of here, Baldy! He called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two she-bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. I'm a shooter, goddammit. Cross me again, I'll put a bullet through your head! Not that kind of shooter. I'm a peace-loving shooter. A cameraman. I might appear to be short, bald, and angry on the outside, but I assure you I am tall, happy, and handsome on the inside. I am a walking contradiction. Let's get this thing started. In three, two, one. <laughs> Welcome to the first installment, the first of its kind, the first ever episode of the Short, Bald, and Angry podcast. My name is Ian Cinco. Our guest today is Samir Gupta. He's a client of mine and a dear friend. He's a musician. He plays tabla and drums. He's a drummer extraordinaire. He's a composer. He's co-founder of Brooklyn Raga Massive, a collective of Indian musicians and just generally a lot of musicians in, the, in New York City. In Brooklyn, the tri-state area. On this episode, we're we're uh, we're promoting a West Coast tour for his band, A Circle Has No Beginning. He's going to be out in the Blue Well in Los Angeles on August 13th. He's going to be at the Center for New Music in San Francisco on August 16th, and he's going to be at Freight and Salvage in Berkeley on August 19th. So if you're out there, I highly encourage you to go out and listen to it. It's uh. It's Indian classical music as well as modern jazz. And uh, it's, it's an honor to know Samir. He's an amazing guy. And so is everybody in the entire collective known as Brooklyn Raga Massive. And I have to shout out my good friend Josh Adler for introducing me to all of them. would never have met them in the first place. Josh was documenting them uh, years ago. And in 2015, he brought me on to shoot the first ever, my first ever Brooklyn Raga Massive show at Pioneer Works. And uh, the rest is history now. I've been working for them since then. I also want to thank Adrian H. Tillman for allowing me to use the photo of Samir that appears in the thumbnail of this episode, if it's on YouTube or, or, or uh, SoundCloud. I'm not sure where you're seeing it, but there's a thumbnail of Samir, and I've drawn into it. I chopped it up. I call these, these, uh, these photos that I draw into uh, photo chops. I photo chopped it. You get it? And... Uh, Samir's photo chop uses a photo by Adrian H. Tillman. So thanks again, man. I'm not sure if we ever met, but I think I was probably at that show you shot that, that photo at, but, but we didn't meet. I'm sure we've crossed paths. Thank you. But in the future, I want to try to use pictures taken by me, unless the guests live in different states or countries or something, uh, and they have to mail me photos, or maybe I'll keep mining Facebook and social media for photos of guests to photo chop. So guests on the podcast get an original Cinco photo chop for free, free of charge. But I do ask that if, if the guests want to use it professionally or promotionally, that they pay me a small licensing fee. As for the rest of you, if you want one, please hit me up. We can talk, uh, and we can come up with a fair price based on your income. If I had a million years to live, I would want to do a million of these before I die. But since we don't live forever and the world seems to be coming to an end anyway, I'll just try for as many as I can while I am here. Hit me up. Let me know if you want one. I, I don't care who you are. I want to do one of you. So being that this is the first podcast, I will try to keep this intro short. Today's episode of Short, Bald, and Angry is brought to you by Massage Tickles. After a long, hard day at work, do you find yourself craving pleasure, but you feel too tired to perform? Or maybe you're just tired of having too many devices around your house. Massage Tickles is here for you. This is a great massaging device that doubles as a dildo. Buy two for the double tickle. Relieve your pain and pleasure yourself at the same time. Get your Massage Tickles today. Visit www.patreon.com forward slash I-A-N-C-I-N-C-O. I'm just kidding. I don't have any sponsors. This is my first podcast and I'm diving in. I haven't thoroughly set up a business plan or thought through all outcomes, and I sure shit didn't line up any sponsors. But if you want to become my sponsor, get in touch. Info, all this info that I, that I list off in this podcast will be in the description below. 
You can reach out to me directly at ian.studiosinco at gmail.com. That's I-A-N dot S-T-U-D-I-O-C-I-N-C-O at gmail.com. And uh, for those with sharp attention spans, that URL I just rattled off is indeed the link to my Patreon account. I do need to plug my Patreon today. Please head over to my Patreon and become my patron. Uh, you can give me as little as $1 per post, or if I, but if life is being good to you, like please consider paying more. You know, my goal here is to support myself with this. Like, so tell a friend to tell a friend. Please spread the word. Share my work. Anyone you know who likes art or entertainment, send them my way. To begin with, I'll, I'll be sharing mostly time lapses of my professional and personal art practice. The first few episodes of this podcast will be made public right from the start. But somewhere around the third episode, I'll start making everything exclusive to my patrons only. So if you don't pay me, you will have to wait to hear the new podcasts. But if you join my Patreon, you will have exclusive first listenership. So please do that. Consider doing it. A dollar, a dollar per post, you know. And I'll, and I'll be reasonable. I won't be, you know, I, I know I'm, I'm known as a prolific guy, but I'll try to keep it to one, between one to three posts per week. Uh, I'm going to try to average one post a week. Like, let me be realistic with myself here, too. I'm not expecting to become an overnight success here. I'm still going to have to be working other jobs. So the goal is one post a week. So I won't be taking tons of your money. So I often get asked, one of the first questions I get asked by pretty much everybody when I tell them I'm doing a podcast is, what's your podcast about? This is an arts and entertainment podcast. I would, uh, I would say that we could stretch it to include all media. That's to say, we could talk about everything and anything on this show. If, if you're a guest, we could talk about anything. Um... I am going to do and say whatever I want on my podcast. Sometimes it'll be audio only. Sometimes I might make videos and maybe we'll do some sketch comedy or something. Maybe I'll do some mini docs on my guests. But all that's a ton of work. And uh, this podcast, it's already its already proven to be a sort of difficult obstacle to get it all together and post ready. It's, it's proven to be an obstacle to get it ready to post. So... The goal here is to keep it to keep it easy, right? It's easy to record these things, so I think I'm. It's not so easy to edit them and get them all ready to go. So I think I'm probably going to keep most of them to be to audio only. They're going to be audio only, but uh, but this first one and the first few, they uh, they include time lapses of art I've made for clients, and I'm I'm talking to my clients and collaborators and and uh, and you can watch as I make the art as we talk, or you can just listen to it. That's cool too. So, uh, so why am I doing this, and why should anyone listen to me? I'm just another privileged white dude, and, uh, and plus everybody has a podcast now. I know, I know I'm going up against everybody. And the World Cup, the World Cup is going on right now. Actually, it ended a couple days ago. France won. But it's crazy to think when, when, you, uh, when you put yourself out there, when you put your work out there, that in some way, in, in one way or another, you're, kinda, you're going up against everything. You are competing with everything. That's wild. It's funny to think about that. But um, I, uh, I usually don't really feel like answering the question, like, why should anyone listen to me or why should anyone check out your art? Like, I don't really feel like it's my responsibility to answer that question. If you don't feel like checking it out, don't check it out. Go away. Get out of my face. I don't care. But, uh, but I am going to be uh, talking to people who I respect about things we're, we're both passionate about. I expect my guests will teach me things as I talk to them. And, uh, and I think we're going to have a good time. It's going to be interesting conversation, hopefully very entertaining conversation too. I'm a pretty smart guy, but nobody knows it all. There's, there's always room to grow. There's space for more knowledge in our brains. So since I'm mostly a hermit and an artist, it'll also be great to connect with people again, to bring them into my studio or to go out in the world and meet up with them. Um, I used to be scared shitless of this kind of thing. There was a, a time in my life where I never could have imagined doing this. Um, a younger version of me would have said, no way, I'll never do it. I, I'd, I'd rather run away and, and go hide somewhere. Uh, but I'm, I'm very comfortable when I'm having one-on-one -on -one conversations. And, uh, and I'm a director. I've, I've, I've overcome all kinds of fears producing and directing since about 2009. And, uh, and one day I thought, I should, I should just do this podcast. One, one reason I can admit, or a few reasons I can admit the re for doing this, uh, it's, it's a shameless way to self-promote myself. You know, I'm, 
I'm uh, I'm trying to raise my social currency, if you will. I wanna I wanna become a, a filmmaker still. I wanna I wanna you know get my work out there. I want people to know who I am and know my work, and I want to get paid for my work. I want to get paid well for what I do. Um, and when you're short, bald, and angry like me, your looks usually don't get you anywhere. Uh, it's a great excuse to invite all kinds of people to reveal their magic tricks, you know. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna hopefully get some really amazing people here as the years go by. That's that's what I hope at least. And and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna try to trick them into revealing all their tricks, and then you can hear them too, because that's the age we live in. We live in the podcast age now. Everybody wants to hear stuff like revealed. Everybody wants to know how the magic trick is done. Um, you know, and they say don't meet your idols or your heroes because they'll disappoint you or they'll make you feel like shit. You know, and I don't I don't think I've necessarily met many of my idols per se, but I have met I have met some I've met quite a few celebrities and uh, well-respected people. And I kind of found that to be true. It's kind of discouraging like you you come away from it having your sort of energy zapped, you know? They can be assholes and and you can't really blame them for it, you know? They're surrounded by all kinds of fucking morons and and leeches and people who just, you know, suck them dry all the time. So they, they you know, it's hard to trust people. I don't, I can't really blame them for being that way. But uh but with a podcast I get to bring them on and we get to have, hopefully, great conversations, you know? Um, but another reason I'm doing this is because I kind of do it already for a living. I shoot docs, I shoot behind the scenes, I've worked in reality television, I shoot live music all the time. I shoot all kinds of things for companies, you know, stuff that you'll never see and you probably don't even want to see. You know, and in, in doing that, I shoot a lot of interviews. Sometimes I'm the interviewer. Sometimes someone else is do, asking the questions. Sometimes, you know, it's a friend, a colleague, a close collaborator asking questions. Sometimes it's a total moron, and I'm staring across watching this, this total moron ask really stupid questions to somebody, and I'm thinking, damn, I should be doing this. Why is this person in this position? I should be asking these questions. You know, and I think the real light went off in my head when I was beginning to write my second feature-length film, a title that I will not yet reveal, uh, that will be that will be coming in the future if if I if I have my way, but I was interviewing a lot of people in the fire world, uh, fire breathers, fire eaters, fire spinners, all kinds of people in the fire world, and uh, and it occurred to me while listening back to these conversations that it was it was totally a podcast. Uh, these conversations were maybe a little more ca- candid, and and the people I was interviewing were revealing things to me that they probably wouldn't reveal on a podcast. But it wasn't really hard for me to imagine uh, switching gears, shifting gears to, to, just, to just say, like, let's make a podcast. Let, let's talk openly and make sure we don't say things that we, that we don't want people to hear, of course. So, uh, so I think that's really when the light went off. It was like I was interviewing all these people and I was like, damn, I'm already making a podcast. Why don't I just make it official? Why don't I just do a podcast? But that was years ago. Um, I, can, I can totally fully admit that I'm hoping that this, this will uh, help drive celebrities my way so I in turn can become something of a celebrity you know it's like I said I want to raise my social currency I want to I want to be a name I want to be a director who's known whose work is known and I want people people's careers to be you know made more viable through the projects I bring to life and that that ain't going to happen where where I'm currently at so you know this this is hopefully going to be part of you know a, a mechanism in the engine that drives me to my end goals but I am also extending an open invitation to anyone to be on the show. I don't want this to grow into some kind of pretentious artist showcase. Or, In fact, I don't mind keeping it lowbrow. If you're an artist or an entertainer or a past collaborator or my family or my friend, or even if you think you're my enemy, let's hash it out through some tense conversation on a short, bald, and angry podcast. Reach out to me. Get in touch. We can talk. You can, you can send me ideas of things you want to talk about. Maybe you want to perform something on the show. You're welcome to. You're welcome to submit ideas, but it's not required. Just just get in touch with me. Shoot me a note. Say I want to. Say Ian, I'm I'm interested in talking to you so that other people can hear what we talk about because I'm an egomaniac like you. It's uh. It's July, 2018. It's Friday the 13th, as I record this here intro to this here podcast. And uh, to this day, I have never been to a therapist. I'm uh. I have a lot of excuses why I don't go. I'm just kind of too cynical. And, you know, like, I might not be a stand-up comic, but, but I have a very comedic mind, and I'm, I'm too smart for my own good. I can think of a hundred reasons to make fun of uh, 
therapist the therapist patient relationship. But what I predict before this year is over, I will I will I will finally break the ice and and go to therapy. Uh, my health insurance should cover it, and I need to think about the people in my life, my loved ones, you know, who I may be scarring with my negative attitude. Uh, you know, and I want to I want to change and grow and become more of a positive person and inspire people. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I'm, I'm at a place in my life where the list of things I want to do before I die just keeps getting longer. And my ability to do them has been hindered. And, and just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, I got a puppy. And she ruined my life. Of course, she's making my life better, too. But, but for like four months, it was just absolute hell. And my, my life, which was already on a downward spiral, just went all the way down. I went super low. And I, I really, I, I, I can't really enjoy anything. I, like, imagine me, somebody who wants to make films and comics, finding myself in a place where I can't enjoy either. Uh, I know this is common among people in their mid-30s or 40s or wherever you, you know, older, older, it happens to older people, it happens to younger people too, but it definitely happens to people when they start to get older. Uh, you know, the, the, the stresses and the struggles and the failures and just everything just sort of, sort of just finally washes over you and you feel like, God damn, I just... I just don't enjoy anything anymore, you know? So that's, that's a reason to go to therapy, I think. Uh, but I imagine, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I want to make films. I want to make comics. I want to make art books. I want to make a ton of art. I want to inspire people while, through that, you know? And I imagine this podcast will end up being something like a therapy session for me, but I don't want my listeners to have to listen to all my problems. I want to be in a healthy state of mind. So, yeah, I'm I'm going to I'm going to promise you that. I'm not going to be although I will be ranting angrily because it's the short bald and angry podcast, not not the short bald and happy podcast. I'm not going to use this I'm not going to use it as my therapy session. I am going to make sure that I'm bringing on quality guests and talking about interesting things or at least things that interest me, you know, and I'm I'm assuming that, you know, being that I'm an artist who's been at this for a while that, you know, that I kind of know what I'm talking about and I kind of know what I'm doing. And my conversation should be kind of interesting for that reason. For those reasons. Uh, yeah, like I said, I've, I've wanted to do this for a long time. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm definitely, I feel like I'm, I'm probably rambling on a bit, a bit too much now. Um, as I said, I wouldn't do. I get it now. It's funny when you have your own podcast. It's just it's natural. You want to just ramble. It's it's like this is my time. I'm gonna talk forever. I'll talk all night. Um, but yeah, let's let's uh, let's get started here. Let's let's hear what Samir Gupta has to say. I uh, I I just I one one more quick thing. Like doing this podcast, it felt so good. You know when he when when Samir showed up in the morning, I was feeling a little anxious, a little nervous. You know, some slight butterflies. I don't really get I don't really get nervous because I'm used to some pretty high stress environments. But you know, this was the first time being at the first time and all. I was feeling a little anxious, and Samir showed up. But we got right into it, and it was a great conversation. And when he left, I felt fantastic. I hadn't felt as good as I did that morning. I hadn't I haven't felt that good in a long time. Let's just say that, right? And I surprised myself, like listening back to this podcast and mixing it. I surprised myself with with uh, things I was saying, like. And not, not in a good, not in like a, I said something amazing kind of way. Like Samir, Samir at one point was talking about the responsibility we have as artists. And I just sort of, like my knee-jerk reaction was, I don't feel any responsibility. I just feel this gut impulse to make, to make art. And then like I caught myself instantly and I was like, that's not true at all. Like, like I got to, you know, I was, I was, I was kind of happy that I was able to catch myself and change and change what I was saying to say the opposite, which is I feel an incredible amount of responsibility as an artist. So rather than recap what I was talking about with Samir here, uh, please just just listen and enjoy it. And uh, thank you, Samir, not just for hiring me to document your journey as an artist and not just for hiring me to make this, this poster, this series of posters, actually, but for agreeing to be part of this experiment, this first episode of the Short, Bald, and Angry podcast. So please, everybody, enjoy. Yeah, talking about altered states. That's a, that was a great movie. Classic. I think I don't even remember how old I was when I saw that. I just remember being like, this guy's walk going into a tank. And yeah. It's a sensory deprivation tank. So then I had to figure out what that meant. And he came out 
as this like primitive sort of like prehistoric hominid creature. Yeah, it's like he goes backwards in time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you would think that maybe the, the story should go forwards in time, like yeah. he's experimenting in the new phase of humanity. Instead, they, I think, is that yeah. the point of that movie? Altered states. If you go into a sensory deprivation tank, you're going to turn into a, a primitive man. That's right. Um, all right, so I guess we're just starting. We got uh, Samir Gupta here in uh, the studio today. Thanks, Ian. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about all kinds of stuff, but we're we're specifically promoting your 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 band, A Circle Has No Beginning, and you have a, an upcoming tour. In in uh, it's a West Coast tour, right? Do yeah. you wanna you wanna shout out those dates? Yeah, all in California, um, August thirteenth at Blue Whale in Los Angeles, and then August sixteenth at Center for New Music in San Francisco, and August nineteenth at Freight and Salvage in Berkeley. And that's like a band that combines my old Bay Area community of musicians. I lived there for a very long time, as well as the Brooklyn Cats that I've been connecting with lately, too. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. Yeah. So anybody out on the West Coast, you should all uh, go check out Samir's band. The Circle Has No Beginning. It's, it's beautiful music. Um, so yeah, this is we're kind of doing a couple things at the same time. We have we have this time lapse I made of this art I made I made his new tour poster. So we have this kind of playing in the background as we're talking here. So we're gonna go back and forth probably. We're gonna bounce back and forth between talking about my art and talking about the band. So I guess I guess we'll start off with the band though. I mean I just where did it come about? Like how did this whole idea spring up? Well, you know, for me, making bands and having albums is something that's sort of gone through interesting changes you know with the industry a lot of people uh, have bands that that are always changing like jazz musicians a lot of times they'll they'll be the leader of a project but maybe the group that surrounds them is always changing and sometimes when cats move to new york you know they'll just go and find the biggest names that they can find and they'll they'll like you know spend all their money to secure these tier one musicians and then maybe never play with them on any gig after that you know like, it'll like just be hiring session musicians yeah hiring session and... cats to come in and just play like and blow their minds and then they get the best review they get the best uh you know pr and all these things but then the relationship between those musicians maybe doesn't extend past that recording session date so um that way of making music has never really resonated with me like for me i feel like it's always been about the relationships with musicians and it's been about cultivating a connection and a chemistry and a spark that very early on you can kind of tell is something magical is something that's off the paper it's something that's like uh bubbling you know and then you you cultivate that you know you go and you put out a few records or you spend some time together touring or you rehearse a ton and then stick together and you know get close to each other's stories and and sort of find a way to make a path um as one and I think that was something that I've always been drawn to. And this project is specifically sort of an extension of that story. Um, there's some new people involved on this record. There's also some, some people I've known for many, many years. And so I always try and kind of develop the story in a way that I think is relevant to where I'm at, but also, you know, where my community of musicians is at. Yeah, so you you have the studio session vibe, but these are musicians that you know and love in many ways, like they're family members almost, right? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of them I've known for years and years and years, and then um, a few I've just recently started collaborating with, and I already could tell that there was that chemistry and that spark, and so um, it's just about sort of putting that in motion as well. And you get to bring them to shows, they don't just disappear and you never hear from them again. Exactly, yeah, I mean, like, I'm going to be going um, and performing with a lot of these musicians with next to the several cats on the record out in, in California, and then also out in Europe, we're going to do a couple of little things with different projects and so the, the projects all live and breathe and evolve sort of together also as a family in a way yeah, yeah. Samir is also part of Brooklyn Raga Massive that's how we met I started shooting and documenting uh, Brooklyn Raga Massive and uh, as the name implies it's massive there's so many musicians you all you're, you're a big family yeah and I remember you from the early days too I think uh, just before we started doing a session at La Luz I think we had met just around that time and you had mentioned you lived Works. right next there. Yeah, right, at yeah. Pioneer Works. So Pioneer Works and Red Hook was a really amazing period of time for, for BRM. Um, that was what, like 2016 or maybe something? I 2015? Think it was, I think it was 2016. Uh-huh. Yeah. We met in 2015. I shot you at Pioneer Works before the residency. Yeah. And then you got the, was it 13? 13 weeks. Performances, 13 yeah. weeks. Yeah, it was like th 13 consecutive weeks. B Brooklyn Raga Massive is on this weekly 
uh, series gathering kind of thing. So we've been doing that for so long. But yeah, a lot of shout that. Out, shout know. out that. BRM plays at, at least once a week. Mm hmm. Often more, and all the separate side projects that all the different members have, you could you could probably yeah. see something every night of the week. But, <laughs> but there's at least one night of the week you, you're guaranteed you could go see Brooklyn Raga Massive play somewhere. That's right, and it sort of all started as a as a weekly jam session that is just dedicated to Indian classical music and also music that's inspired by Indian classical music. Um, one of the cool things about New York is the jazz capital of the world, so you can go and find the most amazing jazz jam sessions in New York. But for me personally, and a lot of people I know, Indian classical music is a is a very compelling art form that has a ton of improvisation. Um, it has a ton of virtuosity. And uh, we decided we should get together every week and get this community to come out who believes in this kind of movement around um, Indian classical music and how that can evolve and speak on a modern situation, but also kind of draw connections with other styles. Yeah, and the way the story goes, it started at Branded Saloon, right? That's, That's right, a little dive bar in Prospect Heights, Brooklyn. Yeah, <laughs> and it's definitely something that just keeps picking up steam. You guys are, I've, I've seen you grow since since I first met you. You've easily grown, bigger opportunities have sprung up. And yeah, since those days awesome now we've, uh, we've played, uh, you know, the band Shell for Celebrate Brooklyn. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, we've performed at Town Hall Seattle and just done, you know, the MoMA and... Uh, Rubin Museum, and of course there's Raga's Live Festival, which is this really well-known festival that's been uh, happening for almost the same amount of time, six years almost. How many hours is that? That's 24 continuous hours. Yeah, and talk about like a circle has no beginning. <laughs> like it's yeah. really meant to reflect a, con a one continuous day's worth of music. So we used to do it from midnight <laughs> to midnight. We're you know, changes from year to year, but j essentially it's 24 continuous hours with 24 distinct sets. And each set is a new artist, and a lot of the sets are sort of connected with the cultural cornerstone of um, time-specific Indian classical music. So morning ragas are played at the morning time, and evening ragas are played in the evening time, and that enhances the mood, it enhances the experience. And so it's about curating a festival that kind of encompasses that expansive vision, but also reflects the, the live experience of it. You know, you come in person and you can spend 24 hours experiencing this um and this year it's going to be happening at pioneer works back at pioneer works yeah on october 6th and the past has been at the rubin museum or the last, the last one was at the rubin yeah museum. last year was at rubin and then the year before, the year before that, that was, was pioneer it. works actually but that was the first year that we did it in front of a live audience the the three or four years prior to that we were doing it in wkcr studios right um up in you know up in harlem so it wasn't so much a festival it was just you the band together exactly it was, it was like, like people came online. into the people came into the radio station yeah. um and they would come and oh, you do did their, bring people in yeah everyone came in there and it was just uh every you know everyone was in and out it was musicians a day of craziness or, yeah or fans as well the musicians made there was musicians, no real right. fans you weren't like, you weren't bringing in an audience and yeah so we made that big shift to say you know what let's ticket this let's make it something people can come and see we can pay the musicians more reasonably then yeah um so it's grown to that level so that's been really cool and shout out dave ellibogan who helps put that together that's right? right new york city radio Live, yeah. He's also he has a great podcast where he's interviewed almost everybody in the band. And, That's right, NYC and, uh, Radio Live. It's amazing. It's a way. It's going to be a way more in depth uh, look into raga music than what probably we're going to do here today. <laughs> um, you should definitely check it out. Uh, yeah, I want to make sure I go this year. I, I always drop in, but I never have the the scheduling never works out. Where I could stay the whole time. I'm somebody who likes to like go the marathon. I want to try yeah. and do the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a, such draw, an experience. Draw you all too. Definitely, and you you leave there kind of in like this sense of like, what did I just experience? You know, like this. Uh, Rock is wild. I mean, it definitely takes. I, I think. I think uh, especially here in America, people probably haven't heard of it, but mm -hmm. it takes you in so many different places. And like you said, it, it, it is cut out for specific times of day. Yeah. It's mood based, right? Yeah, definitely. And seasons. And seasons. it's really meant to be something that is about the experience. And so the sort of feeling that comes with waking up the first thing in the morning, um, that there is a certain element of music there that can be captured through Indian classical music. Right. Raga, North Indian classical music specifically is into this time of day thing. And so, um, you know, you'll have evening ragas when the sun is setting and that, that feeling of the day ending, you know, in the, in the night beginning. Like, what is that? It's so hard to put into words. But if there's a musical connection there through uh, sort of, you know, honestly, like centuries of science in Indian music, these people take it so seriously and they infuse the, the sort of emotion into these types of things so much that when you get drawn in, when you sort of decide you have to personally sort of go there you know you have to say okay like it's morning time let's i want to hear this raga 
You know, I want to take a minute to to find the artist I like, to find the instrument that I really want to hear, and find the raga that's good for this time of day. You go through those steps, and and you know, you give yourself over to the potential for some sort of uh, altered state, if you will. <laughs> altered states. Yeah. That's what it's about. It is. It's about shifting and. and you know, th- things change over the course of the 24 hours. It's not just like big life changes. It's like your mood can change dramatically in 24 hours, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, and Raga really reflects that. Um, and there's a big improvisational element to Raga as well. Um, just to bring it back to art a little bit, mm-hmm. There's, uh, it's definitely fun to draw to it. I, I enjoy it. It's great because drawings take a long time. And Raga is improvisational and it can go on for a long time. Yeah. And, uh, and it's the, the beat of it, especially when you're, when, you know, you're a tabla player, yeah. among other things. Yeah. And uh, that beat's really fun to draw to. It's a good thing that kind of keeps you motivated and moving. Yeah, and I think your style, Ian, too, like it's very, um, it's very organic. Like it's very human feeling. And I think that is, it's, it's accentuated in Indian classical music. You know what I mean? Like it, there is a very sort of um, deep down, uh, like, I don't even know, ancient sound there, you know? So it's it's hard to put in words, but I think that, you know, when you when you hear that kind of music and you see the kind of visuals that you, you're coming out with, there is like a, there is a common ground there. There's something earthy, there's something very, um, like the seasons and those kinds of things seem to come out, you know? It's very, it feels very organic and very natural to me. It doesn't necessarily feel like um, something that's, got hard edges and cuts and splices and you know it doesn't seem like loops and digital digitized as much you know it seems like a lot more um like skin and hair and eyes you know raga you mean like your style and yeah and i think raga too raga like, is raga, hairy, it's, like a, it's a hairy earth. you know it's so funny i mean a lot of musicians a lot of indian classical musicians when they describe indian classical music they describe those ragas as people and they when, when they yeah. teach it they actually try and teach it by describing limbs and so they'll wow. say like, um, you know, this certain ung, like like gaiki ung. That means like the vocal t- style. But ung is actually like a word for a limb, That's and awesome. so so it's sort of like a, a a way like an extension or a sort of part of something. Um, and you can kind of get familiar with that ung. You can get familiar with that limb, and then you can kind of perceive how that limb actually shows up in other uh, ragas. And even when they say like this raga has a certain no- feature in its nose or in its eye or in its ear, you can familiar si- familiarize yourself with that shape, and then you'll hear that in different contexts. And that's kind of how you get to love raga music. It's, that's you so start cool. to understand the features. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, raga music is the, it, it, there's it's deep. It's not like some surface level thing. There's, if you're looking for new music, you should definitely get into some raga because it's Hell yeah. it's kind of a gift that keeps giving. You, you, it's endless. I mean. I know, I know the people who study it, they study it for their entire life and probably feel like they haven't even figured it all out. Totally. Or un- I mean, it's like a lot of us are jealous for the kids that start at five years old. Because <laughs> right. we're like, oh man, you know. So and when did you start? I actually started later. I uh, I was originally a jazz drummer. I came to New York as a... So you started a, on the... On, those, those on the drums. drums. Yeah, regular gotcha. drums. I mean, I grew up under the U.S. public school system. So I, I learned uh, marching band and pep band and concert band and wow. actually went to uh, get my bachelor's degree in Western classical music. So I played with symphonies and orchestras. And Can you send me um, some pictures of you in a marching band? So I can lay, <laughs> lay over this video later. <laughs> oh, man. that's I actually have one. Maybe I'll send it to you on the DL. Okay, I don't, I, don't I, don't have have to... that, I don't know if I'm with that getting out. All right, we're not going to show anybody <laughs> this. is top secret. But I will say one thing that I did rock the ruffles of the of the marching band uniform. Nice. Extremely well. I had the hat, I had the vest, and I had the quads, which was like the quads were. You'd think that meant like my my pecs or like my 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 abdominal muscles, but no, it was actually five four or five drums that you wear, you know, with it strapped on your back. So it, it blows like my 70. mind seeing, you always got to feel bad for the drummers or the tuba players, right? Yeah. Like the guys who are bringing around the, the huge instruments. Yeah, it's like, man. Fuck that trumpet player. <laughs> like, yeah, the drummers to... have it rough like that, man. We have to carry heavy, heavy stuff. But um, yeah, and then I got, basically I, after college, actually I would say even through high school, I, I started getting into jazz music and started getting into improvisation and uh, checked out drum set around middle school. I saw a drummer and I was like, wow, I, a drum set player. I was like, I want to check that out and started getting really, really into it. And, you know, with me and my brother, we would just be in the basement rocking out guitar and drums. You know, we'd play Living Color stuff and, you know, 
everything, Rolling Stones, like just all the rock stuff. And you know, and then he he brought home some John Coltrane records, and I was like really drawn to that. And got that was middle very, school. That was high school. Once yeah, well, he like kind of brought some John Coltrane home in high school, and uh, and then in college, I just kind of was like doing that on my own. The college department of school, the school I went to was pretty conservative. You know, it was a classical department. There wasn't much here in the city. No, it was actually in California, um, in the Bay oh, okay. Area. Yeah, it was a small Jesuit school, Santa Clara University. Wait, University. so where, where did you grow up then? You grew up on the West Coast? Or? I grew up a lot of places, Ian. It's crazy. My dad worked for IBM. So okay. like every few years we moved. It was like, I never stayed in the same you were like school an army district. Baby, a tech Kinda, baby. yeah. It's like a lot of the kids that I moved with were army kids, but, uh, uh, but my dad was like IBM. So it was like, you know, kind of whatever. <laughs> it's funny. But, um, you know, I think basically it sort of affected me in a funny way, you know, like to move every three years or four years. It's like it's kind of a strange way to grow up. But music you know more than, than most kids, though, in a way I do. But I also don't have like those really old friendships, like mm -hmm. a lot of people that I know who are like, you know, here, like, oh, yeah, I, I lived. I grew up here in this neighborhood. I've been here since, since I was a kid. Kindergarten. Yeah. Like and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I can't even imagine that must be a really cool feeling you know to have some friend that you've known from when you were born like you know or really oh, yeah. when you were like first grade or second grade so i wish i could have had that but at the same time i'm also very grateful i got to see parts of the world and parts of the country that a lot of people didn't get to see yeah. and um i think it opened up my mind to you know music of the world in a lot of ways and just like i, I was never really comfortable um adhering to like one sort of way I always was really drawn to the multitude of ways in which people experience their life. I lived in Japan for three years, um, just just before I got into middle school, and uh, you know, actually, now that I think back on it, that was where I first heard Johann Sebastian Bach and all this, like, really the very, very formative first recordings I'll never forget was in Japan. And I remember, why why do, you, why do you think that was? Is there a reason? Japan. I think it was probably colonialism because traditional it was colonialism. Like, yeah, American school in Japan, and so you know, I didn't learn anything about Koto or shamisen. That's or any, sad. I learned about Bach. You know, I mean, it's cool to learn about Bach, but it's, yeah. that's that's messed up. Right? Yeah, it is. It is messed up. When I think back on it now, I'm like, man, that, we were just all such victims of of colonialism. But I think that you know, for me, being in Japan helped me realize just how big the world was. Even though if I, and I was in an American school, which was so sheltered, I just really saw how vast the world was. And how even if like coming from America where you kind of feel like you're in a bubble, you're the center of the world to everybody, you go to a place like Japan, it's like you can't feel like any more of a foreigner you right. know, when you're, than when you're in Japan. And so I think I remember getting a real strong sense of, of perspective. At a and, young age. Yeah, at yeah. a young age. And I think that I also... Also, I think even when I came back then, being Indian, you know, in, in America, and even when I was in New York at that time, there weren't many Indian kids at school that I went to, you know? Um, so it was hard for me to even reflect on myself and say, what is it to be Indian? You know, it was like this sort of, so many negative things. It's like I would go away for the summer to go to India for three months and come back and I'd have to like give a summer report to my, to my classmates about what I did over the summer in India. And these kids are like awful. They just see it as a chance to like make fun of you. You know what I mean? Yeah, kids, kids are really shitty. Do you <laughs> so, feel like that's been a big struggle in real life? Like figuring out your identity and, and how you sit around it? Is I that think a... that for a while it was a struggle. Um, and I think it was because of experiences like that, you know, where you feel so different from every other person. You know, it's like you don't necessarily know the same shows that people watch on TV. You don't know the same songs that everyone sings, you know, from right. this part. Like, for example, Bye Bye Miss American Pie. <laughs> I had so many friends in college that knew every word to that song. And I'd never learned the words to that song. I was never in a position to feel the cultural sort of baggage that that song carries for some people. That is a very American song. It's, it's funny. It's like a, you go to a wedding. A girlfriend is Thai, and like that, I feel like that always happens at a wedding. You know, like when yeah. my cousins get married, or, or like our white friends get married, it's like that song comes on. Yeah, I mean, I would say everybody kind of knows it, but it's like, yeah, it's it's a weird thing where you see a bunch of white people singing that song. You're, I imagine I could see how you feel that way. Yeah. <laughs> so I think <clears throat> those kinds of things made it a struggle to to understand my identity, and then I think uh, my own mentality sort of went towards a place that was more. Uh, just breaking free of a lot of the preconceived paths and ways that people think. And I think it led me to appreciate the kind of ways that you make art, honestly, where, or, or even fantasy writing, you know, or even books or fiction or, um, 
being able to really push very far outside the box. Yeah. Um, avant-garde music, you know, avant-garde film, like all those kinds of things. How do you how do you let those things inform you so that a struggle, like even if it is a struggle for me, I see, I can hear the struggle and I can see the struggle in some sort of work of art, you know, and that, that helps. That's like medicine, you know, because someone has shown you their struggle and, and they made it through enough to at least to like put something out that's beautiful. Yeah. And, and it that's reflects art. some struggle. Yeah. That's art to you. I was going to ask, yeah, like what, what is the heart of your art? Like what, what is art to you even? Because, hmm. uh, because I, I agree. I think I think I want to see a struggle in art. I want to see emotions or hear emotions, feel emotions. Yeah. I, I like raw things that are that are like rip rip wounds open and show us show us how hard the reality of the world is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and definitely not shy away from the tougher things or be experimental too. That's right. that's great. I get very bored with the the cookie cutter stuff. The <laughs> yeah. Mainstream stuff. And definitely, and I think that that's probably because those cookie cutter things that we are talking about. A lot of times you can see that there was no struggle there. If anything, it was it was very rote beforehand. You know, they followed a, a process that maybe was a formula that they were very confident would work. Right. Um, another interesting thing I think is that at those times when you see art, which is very beautiful and like just kind of uplifting and optimistic, sometimes those come out of places which are the artist is struggling a lot. You know, and I think that those types of experiences are, are what art is about too. You know, it's about being in a beautiful place and understanding the polarity there and being in a very, very hard place and understanding how you can reflect the polarity there. That how is the, how do you make that journey from darkness to light or from between those two places? So I think for me growing up, I felt that a lot between my Indian heritage, my American upbringing. It's like, how do you, work with these two polarities you know like i i'm a big fan of, of spock from star trek like and one of the reasons is because spock is a child of two worlds he's like you know half uh, vulcan he's half human yeah that's it with the v <laughs> live long and prosper so i think you know yeah for, he is right yeah he's a child of two two separate cultures right and then the the human side of him is like you know, he kind of early on sees it as a flaw, like emotions, the emotions and that right. kind of thing. Like, the, and the Vulcan side is all about logic and, and very cold, calculated stuff. Right. Um, and then he learns about friendship. He learns about these human qualities, which, which actually, when originally they were thought to be weaknesses, they actually he sees them as strengths. Right. Um, and so I think that that is kind of I feel like a really accurate depiction of how I feel about my own evolution. Like those things that I maybe was so pushing back against when I was younger, you know, like like 40s and 50s Bollywood music or like, you know, sitting cross-legged or even going and putting the, the red tikka on my forehead on those on the holy days. Every one of those things was something that I was a little bit like, Ugh, like I don't want to I don't want to do that. Like it's so fighting weird. Tradition. When yeah. you were young, you were younger fighting Yeah, tradition. because I kind of saw it as this other thing that I didn't really necessarily want to be a part of. I'd rather be seen as American or rather be seen to have this thing that's a little bit more firmly in, in what I understood was easier. It wasn't quite as much of a struggle. And I think later as I got older, I realized how much those those things that were part of my Indian heritage, how much I loved them and how much they defined me. And then I started to really appreciate everything about them, you know? And even my mom today will be like, I'd never see you eat okra. Like, why do you like okra now all of a sudden, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't even know why. I just know that this is the taste of taste something. Taste expand yeah. as we get older. Yeah. And, it, and we go back like, to appreciate those things we didn't appreciate when we were kids. Exactly. And it's not just because we're know. older. It's actually like we've changed um, in a very genuine way. Yeah. And so I think that now when I look at where I'm headed musically, I think that I'm I'm very much embracing both sides yeah. and I'm trying to make it seem like the most seamless sort of unified uh, artistic expression of all those elements, you know, and synthesizing. Yeah. yeah. And really try and make it like it, what it is, which is just new and it's me and it's a very genuine reflection of what I'm about. Yeah. Are you talking specifically about Circle Has No Beginning right now or, I think or that, just everything I think, you're doing? I think all my work has right. tried to tap into that. I mean, early on, I would say maybe four records ago, I was playing with a group called The Supplicants. And that was all pure spontaneous improvisation. We wouldn't really try and rehearse or conceive of a song beforehand. You just set up the mics We'd, and just start, start jamming. Playing. Yeah. And we would try and conceive of the songs in a very spontaneous composed way so they sounded like they were actually very cohesive songs but they were conceived of in the moment 
And uh, so sometimes the songs would be 20 minutes long, but sometimes they would be like seven minutes long and they would actually sound like real songs, but there would be something about them which was extremely uh, difficult to like nail down what exactly was happening there. You know, it was like sort of otherworldly in a way. And so those types of things were very reflective of what I wanted at that point. That was right after I graduated from my Western classical degree, which was such a heavy composed on the paper thing with little room for interpretation, little room for personality. So I like completely did a 180. I was like, you know what? I don't even want to look at sheet music now. I want to just like, com I want to get together on like an ESP level. That's the way life goes, right? You focus really hard on, on something for such a long time. It's natural impulse to go 180, pendulum swing the other way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Circle Has No Beginning, I think, is really a, a reflection of where I am now. And so there's a lot of this uh, breathing of Indian classical music in there. I, I wanted to bring in... Um, the instruments that are representative of that, but I actually wanted to bring in the players that were reflective of that uh, heritage. So a lot of the Indian classical musicians like Jay and Arun, they're like the next up and coming generation of like Indian classical musicians, you know what I mean? They, they go up on stage and perform next to their gurus on like the top stages. And then I feel very lucky I get to be like, hey, come in the studio with me and play some crazy like music where we're just gonna improvise and be completely open and have keyboards and basses and harps and cellos and drums and everything. Jay Gandhi and Arun Ramamurthy. Yeah. Phenomenal musicians. Yeah. Jay, Jay blows my mind sometimes. I'm just like, I can't believe where he's going with that flute. <laughs> the bonsari, as it's called. That's right. I had him and Dave here one night, and he was like, it's the bonsari, and my goal in life is to make sure that every man, woman, and child knows the name of this, this <laughs> instrument. So I just want to say that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I'm going to help him make sure every man, woman, and child knows the name of that instrument. That's right. And I think you have a picture in here of, of, a, of one of the limbs of the, of the animal. I threw a bonsari in there. Yeah, it's yeah. small. Yeah. I this was it. this was a difficult piece because even though I did it big, as you as you see, where are we right now? I think I think at this stage I'm still I'm working here on my on my Cintiq, right, and uh, and so I'm still like working out the thumbnail essentially at this point, or working into the thumbnail. But yeah, it's just like those details are kind of lost. It's like I I wanted I want to take that creature and make that creature even bigger so you can really see. Really, I can really dig into all those details. I, am, I remember I specifically wanted uh, there to be a scale, a comp, like a, like a sense of perspective, where even though we would feel that the mon the, this creature is huge, it would actually be small in the distance. Um, so I think that probably made it harder for you. To I could probably throw, yeah, I, I could throw more creatures in the background to show them even smaller and stuff. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but so how many do you find that balance, do? like between trying to make it detailed and big and epic and, and sort not of, too cluttered and not and well we're and just far away you and know far away. it's hard distance. it's hard with these vertical compositions yeah i feel like uh i don't know if we're gonna if you're gonna hire me to do any more of these but <laughs> um i would like to experiment with more horizontal composition because uh -huh. then i could do all kinds of things interesting yeah these vertical compositions it's, it, it really kind of limits you in a weird way as to how far back so, yeah creating depth in a vertical composition is difficult actually mm. um yeah, one thing that I remember we talked about too was the the work right before the this one, right? Was the the one with that goddess figure, mm -hmm. and that yeah, was we were like, talking about making up a goddess. We talked about Sarasvati yeah. and a lot of other uh, Indian goddesses. But yeah. yeah, I wanted to make one up. Yeah, and and then we were sort of I was asking you to take that figure that you made, which was really the forefront of the first poster, and kind of throw it in the distance, but have that almost that same similar moment captured in time. But from a totally different part, like from a, like almost like you've swung the camera to another scene, um, where that that goddess figure is is far away, but you know it's still part of what's going on. But there's actually another focal point, yeah. um, and I thought that was really cool how you did that because, in a way, like it looks almost like you've you've moved um, across several axes. So you know the the hand that's holding the thanpura and the sword and all that kind of stuff like that was in the, the foreground on the other picture almost like right in front and in this it's almost like it's flipped from the back like you're looking at it backwards now like those figures are almost like behind them and underneath them yeah yeah i was imagining it like she was mutating and warping into something else cuz yeah whenever i think of uh, godly creatures or things like that like i imagine them yeah i i could see how they would take on a human form just so that we can conceive of them, but I also think that they would have this ability to shift into something, if, if such a thing was real, yeah. it would be able to shift into something that's unrecognizable. So even this is still recognizable, you know, you see the human limbs coming off of it, but 
at any moment it could turn into almost whatever it wants. Like a god or a goddess would be able to be whatever they want to be, right? Yeah. And it's cool how there is such a cleanly distinct hand coming up from the earth. Right. Yeah, really, that, really that comes like from that. a piece you saw in my book yeah. that you liked. You were like, that's that's what I want. So I was like, should we just put the hand in? <laughs> we'll just put a hand in. Yeah, well, giants actually, are a big part of my mythology. I have yeah. a comic I've been working on forever. There's tons of giants in it. Yeah. All these, this all comes from like mythology I've created since I was a kid. Oh my gosh, I had no idea about that. That's really cool. Yeah, totally. I've, I've, we're aligned. What, what, what you want is aligned with my future vision, <laughs> things I'm working on. I mean, one thing I really love about that hand coming out is like everyone talks about Mother Earth mm-hmm. and talks about the Earth as this like thing that we should care for. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you see it sort of reflected this way, it, it almost feels like a cry for help. You know, like this hand that's like reaching up. It's like, yeah. I we I need a hand here. <laughs> yeah, give, give, the world needs a hand. Yeah, the, the world, world needs, needs help hand. right now. Exactly. Seriously. And I think the, um, it was really, I really love how later I saw this like kind of elephant figure uh, sort of charging in from the clouds. Um, and, and then I think after I mentioned that, you were saying, oh yeah, I kind of see that now too. Yeah, I'm sorry I didn't emphasize it even more, but there... No, it's, yeah. it's actually great. I, I don't think it needs any more. To me, was it's... Was it Ganesha? Yeah, well, the elephant god, I mean, of course, Ganesha is there. Um, and I think that I really... There's just like a mood. I think mm-hmm. that's the part that I think I really love. Like, every little element of this is like telling a story. And when... In the music that we that I'm playing, like the moment in improvisational music, it's all about the moment, you know, and it's about uh, sort of giving yourself over to that sliver of time, right? And Almost forgetting about the bigger picture. In a way. Yeah, but then you also are kind of you have to in that moment process like everything that has led to that moment. Right. You know what I mean? Like yeah. no moment stands alone. Right. So you have to sort of see and feel the momentum that came to reach that moment. How do you how do you think forward. of that? Is that like something do you think of it like it's in the back of your head? Is it in the is like the future in the foreground and like yeah. that's in the back of your head? Like how do you do you visualize any of that or is it just kinda like intuitive at this point? You know, it really depends. I mean for me it's it is a it's like a flow. Right. You know, it's like you're getting in a river. Especially music. Yeah. Flow. Yeah. And and you have to kind of give yourself over, which means that you can't be too caught up in the back of your head and the forward. You know, it's really about giving as much justice as you can to this this one like you're aware snapshot. Of it. Yeah. You're aware of it, but you're not Definitely aware, on it yeah. Yeah, it's not like that is the thing that you're gonna carry through, you yeah. know, because then you're just not really giving hundred percent to where you're at right then. Yeah. It's it's hard to say what the process is. I think that it's something that you, like in this picture, every character I feel like has this backstory. You can you can see that there's a backstory for every character. From the two figures climbing up the steps to the hand coming out of the ground, to the elephant, you know, Ganesha sort of creature charging out. Right. There is, like, motion, you know, and there's, like, a, they have arrived at a spot. And I feel like it's the same thing on that previous one with the goddess in the in the sky or in the album release poster. Um, it seems like we've suddenly captured a, a moment in time that's significant, you know? Things are happening, and, and uh, there has been maybe... An, an event, but we're not aware of. But we do know that, like, it has led to here. And there's like, a, there's motion. There's like intensity. Um, so I think that is, that is a big strong connection. I think with the music, you know, there's, there's all these sort of trajectories happening at the same time. Like we don't know what led the, the hand to come out there. We don't know what happened to these figures before they got there. Definitely mysterious. I think I think people should look at this kind of puzzled, but. I definitely hope that they invent their own stories. You know, I would be curious. I would love to give people like a pen and pad and just like jot down what you think is happening here. Definitely. Like, don't take too long. Just what do you what do you think this is? Exactly. I it's mean, fun. it's like the world is so crazy today too. You know, I mean, what is today? The twenty first of June, two thousand eighteen, and this was like a week ago. Parents and kids were being separated at the border. They still are, and they still are. Yeah. And uh, when I saw this with the with the fig two figures on the steps, like it just like it hit me so hard. Like you know. Um, and it was like scary. Like my wife looked at it. She's like, this is so scary. And I, when I first looked at it, I was like, you know, I, I guess it's scary. It's also kind of like uplifting in a way. And then I looked at it again. I was like, dang, it is scary. <laughs> I think that's what, I think that's people respond to that. You know, horror, horror, the horror genre yeah. is like one of the most popular things for a reason. You know, it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's primal. 
Yeah. That's always... I studied screenwriting a ton because I still want to make movies and things like that. I'm obsessed with storytelling. Yeah. And the one word that comes up is like, emotions are important, empathy, but, but primal. Yeah. You know, and like, even though we live in this society where we're pretty... We're in bubbles. We're all in our separate bubbles. We, we're, we're obsessed with this like horror element of reality because it's it's there. It's like this weird primal scary thing that's below the surface or even there and we just block it out because we, we numb ourselves so we can just exist and not go crazy. Yeah. But yeah, I, I feel like that's what, that's what happens when you're making art. You're kind of like getting in tune with all that stuff. Yeah. I mean, it is a very scary time and it sometimes, you know, it's been months now where I've been like, man, I just like, I worry about my kid and oh, I yeah. worry about, you know, I like will sit there and I'll be like, what would happen if a nuclear bomb went off in Manhattan? I like, stopped <laughs> thinking about that during the Obama administration, but yeah. I'm totally back to just staring out this window. And I, vis- I vi- like we're looking at the Empire State Building exactly. right now. And yeah, I, I, I hate saying it, but I picture it all the time. Yeah, me too. And I think that's kind of the world we are in. Like it just it's we it's scary to think that this is all on the brink. Like we're always on the brink of something that could really just be cataclysmic. And we got all these arrogant moronic leaders running around the planet exactly and you can't like trust any of them really they're all just still playing the political game i just think you know that's why i like that in this picture there's just two people Mm -hmm. and and really it's like the rest of it is just almost like chaos it's almost like a war is going on well i feel like just getting back to your original idea for this whole thing i didn't entirely capture your original idea i'm not apologizing (laughs) because i think we've got some good things going on yeah but yeah your original idea was you wanted an apocalyptic uh, landscape. You wanted you wanted to see the remnants of a city. Yeah. So, if this is scary, it's because it's coming out of your original it's idea. True. You were asking for an apocalyptic scene. You know, the <laughs> reason why I think we actually got to it, and in a way, I'd say we got to it better, mm-hmm. is because um, in addition to the apocalyptic type of energy, I wanted there to be a a sense of the earth growing back. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what this record, a sort of circle has no beginning, is about. It's like it's about the cyclicalness of this. And how even if we're at the point of just destruction, yeah. there are actually forces at the same time that are towards creation. And those are going concurrently as everything else. It's just about your perspective and it's just about your relative sense of what you are focusing on. Um, I mean, one cool thing I like about this picture is even at the top of the tower, you see these figures kind of being... This is launched. where I, this is probably, I probably just added them in there right now. Uh huh. At the time, at this time lapse that we're looking at. Yeah. yeah. What, what about this? I just, I, to me, it, it reminds me of like, at first I was like, ah, oh, right. It's almost like you're, the, these figures are being released from the mortal sphere or something. Yeah. You know, like they've reached the top of the tower. You they, said, you said that was disturbing too when you first, right? That's what you said on the phone. We, yeah. You know? I agree. I mean, I think that I mean, they're whimsical. I was, they're they're it's, goofy. I, like, I'm not sure almost. if they're leaping off like in ecstasy, yeah. or they're being like sucked into this monster. I think it's both. Right. I think it's like this ecstatic lemming drop or leap. Yeah. So that's why I was also they're like, about to get absorbed into that thing. You exactly. Know? And I think like I wonder if that thing is good. <laughs> you know, if that if that creature with the sitar and the if that is where you want to be in the end, like are these I think all it's like, are these all politicians being flung <laughs> oh, into the yeah, air and all the worst into of them. like Donald Trump? We're gonna launch them off and they're gonna get sucked into this <laughs> goddess. Say goodbye, and the Earth, Mother Earth, will reclaim them or whatever this goddess. This yeah, universe, I mean, it's, it's tough universe. to say like who is what character and what role they play, but I think that's actually probably the energy too. Is like yeah. these people are like in ecstasy and agony kind of like being drawn into this uh, massive like monster creature in the background. And then in the foreground, there's this child that's sort of being guided up there. Yeah, then, like, I, what does I, that I feel say? like a good question would be like, is, is, is this child going to be led up there and then like yeah. let off like a sacrifice? That, that should be a good thing I mean, thing it's to wonder, interesting but... to think about. Like maybe that is that whole step, those steps to the top of the tower is one journey. You start yeah. the bottom step as a child. And then you end the journey at the top of the tower. Sure. And at that point, you, you've you accepted all agony, all ecstasy. And it doesn't matter if it's a monster or if it's a if it's like a, an angel that's gonna, that you're going to you know unify yourself with. It's funny how sometimes one image says everything. And then you could make a movie with 100 images and you say nothing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, this, this one image here, it, it encapsulates all life life you know all the seasons yeah all the separate moments in life the whole thing is right here in this one picture right and then you'll release like a giant 
you know, film, and it'll just be vapid. Yeah, <laughs> that's what's next. I'm going to work on this feature film for three years, and it's going to come out. It's going to mean nothing, and nobody's going to like it. And I'm going to go back and make one illustration, and people are going to love it. Yeah. I actually really also <laughs> loved the, the green coloring you got on the grass. It was... Uh, yeah. I don't know if we're going to see that later, but I thought... We will. That, yeah. Actually, I'm not sure. I mean, you'll see it, but I don't... Yeah. I, yeah, I came in, and I wasn't always screen capping. Yeah. It was kind of hard. Some My computer kept crashing, and sometimes I just, like, I'm, I'm doing all these time lapses now, and it's great. It's like I release them, people respond to them more than anything else that yeah. I put up. But it's kind of a pain in the ass, too, and it's good to just... Un it's actually good to unplug, and art especially. Like, you sometimes just want to do that to unplug. Right. You want to, you want to get away from all the technology. So to have... To have this camera over my shoulder or to be constantly screen capping what I'm working on the screen, mm -hmm. it just it gets too annoying sometimes. So I actually did not capture all of all of what's uh, all of the work I did on this. But I am going to say what I told you earlier, which was I I have 28 hours of documented work here. That's time and lapsed. I and I know for for a fact. Yeah, it's proven. I have it. I can show I can show it to you. <laughs> but I know for a fact I probably did at least 38 hours on this. This is like a crazy labor. Yeah. I put a lot of work love into this piece right here. Yeah. You know, I always I always feel that way when I'm working with musicians, whether I'm doing music videos or now that I'm getting more back into art, yeah. doing album covers and posters and things. It's like I need I need to give it more than 100 percent. Like I can't I can't just do it, crank it out and like, oh, I did my two 200, you know, my, my hours worth. I'm, I'm done. Right. Like I ha it has to go to that. It can't it can't it can't even fall short of that. I always have to go. <laughs> Yeah. Even if I'm not happy with it at the end, I have to feel, like I have to feel like I went all the way over. Definitely. Otherwise, I just like I shouldn't take the job, you know. And, and you know, it, it's a tough it's a tough way to work. It's not maybe not sustainable in the long run. Yeah. Because I do have to pay bills and all that. But but yeah, I want to make sure that not you're not just happy with it, but that I feel like it went all the way that it needed the full extent that it needed to go. Yeah. I mean, it's really it it shows, you know. I mean, I can see even looking at this time lapse, like the the back and forth and the level of details and and trying all the different wow are those more people walking yeah I'm, I'm sad i left them out oh, okay. maybe it's not too late i could still add them in i don't know we'll see yeah, i mean it's cool i mean actually i kind of like that there's no people there it, it was just too hard i feel like they were just getting lost uh -huh. I, I didn't sometimes sometimes i feel like i could do anything and i can do anything or i can draw, yeah. literally draw anything but then once the image is almost done it's like it, it gets constricted by the end and and adding things can kill it. And I what's, feel like, uh, what's this All right, this, so here I've hopped. I've hopped out. I've, I was working on the thumbnail on the Cintiq digitally up to this point. And here I'm projecting that, that thing I did in the computer. And I'm, I'm, I don't think of it as tracing, although probably at moments I was just tracing. I, at this point, I think I'm making the drawing better. You know, I'm, I'm blowing it up. Yeah, I, I feel like I should detail. have blown it up even bigger. It would have looked even nicer. Uh, yeah, the, the detail... It's not that I'm adding more details it's that if anything i'm i'm getting rid of some details and and simplifying things but, right but um but yeah this isn't even the greatest like i've done this i started doing this probably two years ago i used to be against this like tracing super against it hmm. projecting and doing work on top of projection i was super against it but that was a st stupid hang-up i had i don't know who, what do you think someone taught it to me or, to your change of mind uh to getting back into it again yeah. uh just being just wanting to explode as an artist like getting back into my art uh, it was kind of new I, I really i only started getting back into it probably in like 2014 again like uh -huh. I, I sort of dropped it for a long time really you know yeah and uh because i got so into video and film and 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 i think i think with when i'm working in film I, i'm super open-minded especially with like a lot of people on set it's like you have to be open-minded everybody's collaborating and yeah you know you as a music, musician you get it it's like you came out of college you needed to explode improvisationally i mean it's also but, interesting to think how certain methods and certain paths like people will say oh this is like really weird or, or this is not cool or this is not the way it should I think be te done teachers instill it in you it's like you can't you can't trace like come on like you don't want to and i and i agree with them it's like you especially when you're learning how to draw you shouldn't be tracing you, you need to like look at re the world and look at people and draw from life yeah but uh as a professional like i think anything you know and i love i love comics like the thing that really got me into art in the first place was comics yeah and that's a tradition where the artist does a pencil drawing yeah and then they ink over it and sometimes another artist even does that mm -hmm. so essentially to me this is a very similar thing i'm, I'm like kind of inking my drawing so there's no there's no shame in it and it totally. transforms it shifts it into something different i agree and i think that actually when you blow it when you blow it up like you did mm -hmm. um it becomes almost more immersive mm -hmm. um like i think that contributes to the diving into the work and i think i feel that too you know i mean it feels when i look at it even for when i first looked at it 
I felt drawn into it. Mm-hmm. I felt like it was something that the size and the sort of scale of it, the scope of it was big. Um, and I think that that might have been due to the process of like being able to blow up the image and go in and and kind of really. I think it helps make it, it vivid. Yeah. Vivid is a word I think of when I when I do it. And uh, yeah, it, it it just like the brush strokes are nicer, right? Like yeah. it looks better than the digital drawing. I'm learning how to draw in this Cintiq right here. It's a great tool. It's amazing. Yeah. And there are brushes I can get that that you wouldn't even be able to tell. Right. That I did that I did it on the Cintiq, but I don't have. I don't, I'm not like fluent in it yet, so I'm still getting familiar, and I end up hating the drawings I do on the Cintiq. I mean, you you always sort of uh, do pen ink first. Not always, but okay. but mostly. Yeah. Yeah. The vast majority of work I do is usually in sketchbooks and and uh, yeah on paper and mm-hmm. ink. Yeah. Yeah. I love ink. I I love color, and a lot of people don't see my color because it's so time consuming. I, and I haven't been doing a lot of it, but right. Yeah. Primarily ink that I've been working with. Yeah. Yeah. So so here I'm. I don't know where where are we at right now. Now I've now I've take I photographed that that bigger piece. Now we're back in the Cintiq again. Now okay. I'm working digitally again. And I'm, I'm getting ready to, uh, I'm essentially just fixing up the drawing so I can get, get to the coloring phase. Right. I was psyched about this because I, I, I really did want to do digital coloring. And this is the first time, I feel silly saying it, I'm 35 now, and this is the first time in my life where I'm really like getting into digital coloring. Uh-huh. And uh, there's a lot to learn. I'm probably going to take some online courses and uh-huh. beef up my knowledge because it's, because as much as I know about color, doing it digitally is a whole other beast. Do you feel like, uh, <clears throat> you know, those are the things that you would need to go to, like, formal schooling for? Or? I will never go to formal school ever uh-huh. again. I will pay for online courses and follow follow gurus and, like, you know, men and women I admire and love. Like, I'll I'll go to them. Yeah. Or, you know, and everyone does it online. There's all these master classes online. Now. Everybody's sure. got a master class, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you don't, I don't feel like you don't need to pay, you know, an arm and a leg and take out student loans and and go broke and this applies to everybody it's a beautiful age we live in really yeah. like, dark as the world is and even though there's plenty of people who need our help right now if, if you know if we live in america if most of us can just go online and, and learn things for free mm-hmm. it's just beautiful yeah i mean i think especially when it comes to like tools and and you know techniques it's like you know this is stuff that is just going to enhance your like it's going to add to your toolbox for sure um you know and a lot of times even in music production it's like i will go and and sit in a music studio and even if I'm not like behind the controls I'll just sit there and watch there's so and much I'll to really learn look yeah and I'll see yeah, like, going into studios some studios you've brought me to some they blow my mind how many gadgets are around it's crazy <laughs> yeah. what they are I'm like are you even using any of this it's like <laughs> I feel like most of the time they're not they're just they got like five mics going in or five feeds going in and they're just using pro tools or whatever I mean, yeah and and like there's all these gauges and everything but none of it's being you do like I really wonder if they ever use some of that stuff I know <laughs> I, think I know that, some guys do they, they yeah I mean it really I think in the span of a year or maybe six months, I, they probably do use yeah. everything. If you got um, it, you should, right? I mean, it also just depends on what is it, what it is you want. What's you know, you project? might, yeah, you might find one piece of gear or one technique right. that has such a sort of niche appeal. You just want to juice it, and bring, yeah, bring as much out of it as and you, you possibly can. You know, can. you might even be like, you know what, I'm only going to bring this up with this with a couple of projects that are on some specific tip, and, and then you say, ones. yeah, and then when those sessions come in, then you can say, look, I have this little piece of gear here I right. want to show you <laughs> like you know we um, keep it in the back room temperature control exactly room. that kind of thing it's like a fine cigar it's like I don't show this to everybody you know yeah um, I met I met this crazy producer upstate one time and he literally has like a barn with a temperature controlled room where he keeps I want to say thousands at least hundreds of instruments just crazy gadgets and tools and all right. kinds of things you just it's wild yeah and yeah I know here in New York producers have to be a little more economical about what they keep and don't keep but yeah but yeah, even even some of the guys you've introduced me to, they got a ton of stuff. Definitely, there's beautiful studios here, and I think actually I've thought about that also as far as a music parallel. You know, um, like when I see your process here and what you're doing, a lot of this reminds me of you know, there's like stages of recording, like tracking is a very early on kind of right. thing, and then there's mixing. Very yeah, very different stages. Yeah, and then there's mastering, and I was sort of uh, thinking about it in a way that was like you know. It's like if you if you get it all the way up to color, that's kind of like the final mix. Yeah. And then if uh, and then if you were let's say to hand that off to some like boss. Right. And that boss was like, okay, like we're gonna do this and this and this and this and final this and this. That's the mastering. 
Sure. Right. That's like where on an album you would um, write all the technical ISRC codes onto the files. You know, you would uh, fade in and out of the tracks. If there was some like overall sheen or varnish that to put over the whole entire recording, you would do that in master. Right. Um, so like if there was some filter or some sort of. Unfortunately, like, I know I didn't catch the very end of the coloring, which would really oh, like okay. be exactly what you're, the analogy you're making. It would be that. Yeah. But I, I sent you the Photoshop file. The cool thing about working digitally is like same thing with like Pro Tools or anything. You could send me those files. I could send you my Premiere files if I'm making a video. Right. I sent you the Photoshop file for this. You could go in and. And totally fuck it up or make it better. I don't know. I don't know. If you want to try. No, I've tried. It. I've already tried to fuck it up. <laughs> but yeah, that's, I, I got to say, like, there wasn't a time in my life where I was fighting the digital thing and I was very, like, I was the Puritan. I was doing stop, I went, I started doing stop motions. That's what got me, that's what officially launched me into doing video work was I made these stop motions. Yeah. But I was like, I'm going to do everything in camera and I'm, I'm not a digital guy and I don't do that. Yeah. But slowly it's just like been creeping in. Like, I've, be, I've been, I'm more and more open minded every day and I want to mix and match everything. Like, I love traditional stuff, I love old stuff. Yeah, but I really I, I look at what kids are doing now. I look at what everybody's doing, and it's crazy what you can do on just like you don't need this crazy Cintiq or this this studio full of gear. What you can just do on a laptop. So right. it's like we we have to all stay f like sharp and fresh like that because there is a Definitely. kid somewhere who, who's doing everything on on like some shitty laptop. <laughs> totally, and, and they're maybe gonna make stuff better because their their limitations. Gonna I mean, you know, it's it's gonna be the next thing either way. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, this it's I think always there will be a appeal to like the analog method pen yeah. on paper when you totally. actually are playing the actual instrument and you feel and see that impact and in it's person. great that we can't that we won't lose sight of that because yeah i think it's you can't really lose sight of it. i just think that in the end there there will be sort of lots of multiple trajectories going that are, a lot of them are technology tied to technology probably you yeah. know um which is interesting then, because I think that sometimes those technologies then, like when, like for example, just this, this tablet and the pen, that you as someone who is normally analog based have found a way to actually like be inspired to do it, you know, and yeah. you've, you're going back and forth. Oh, I actually saw, oh, no. Well, it especially makes sense to get hired on a job. This, this was a pretty, I mean, I was telling you how hard this was for me, but this is a relatively easy job when you compare it to what a lot of people do in like entertainment and stuff. Right. But it's just crucial. It's, there's just like obviously everybody's working on Cintiqs now because of all the changes that need to be made. You have to work digitally. It's like, yeah. like if you if you had to go back and work old an old fashioned method and make changes in an analog way, you you totally want to shoot yourself in, yeah. in the head. And be like, <laughs> God, I gotta change it. Well, I'm glad we're seeing the coloring here. This is cool. Yeah, I remember we were talking on the phone, and I always want to draw and paint sunsets. I'm obsessed with sunsets, and. Uh, and I didn't draw this. The original drawing of this, I don't think I was conceiving it as a sunset. So in a way, I don't. I don't know if that might be one reason why I'm not totally happy with it because it's like I. Th I think the contrast needed to be. I think we needed like a clear blue sky. I think we needed white clouds, and I think it got really. It's. It's just like too. Too much in mm -hmm. the end. But you know, it, it turned out. It turned out all right. I, th I just want to say, that t too much is a very Indian thing. Yeah. So it's appropriate. <laughs> it's, it's appropriate. It's good. Yeah, it's not. It's that's all right. I'm I'm fine with too much, but I, I also am. I think it's. I think we're also very struck when when there's like a, a, an area of relief in a picture where you, there's yeah. like it's not totally cluttered. I really but, like how you did it. I mean, you know, I think that the thing about sunset to me, or anything in which you can actually perceive um, nature itself reflecting a sort of like moment, mm -hmm. like seasons or or sunset or sunrise. Um, like as opposed to just a clear blue sky, mm -hmm. I think that it adds a layer of a layer of depth of, of like context. literal literal depth. You're literal about. depth, but also I think it adds a layer of context. Okay. So like you know, um, it's like what? How many different things can you drink from in this picture? You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I can I can drink from the sensation of like an adult and a child like mm -hmm. being on this journey together. I mean, you know what does that feel like protecting? Okay, to protect this kid going up these steps even. Right. Um, and to me, like the time of day and sunset, that is something that is like such a human understanding. What does it feel? What does a sunset feel like? I mean, that's like it. Right. Like how can you even talk about that? But no, the fact I mean, is, that there is something they, there. They feel like something. They they. Yeah. That's the magic hour where we all feel kind of crazy and. Wild exactly. things happen. And it's beautiful. It's like breathtaking and beautiful. And, exactly. And, and so it's, it's, it's so trans. Like the transition is so quick. It just happens. Feels like that. Like trying to capture a, a, a sunset drives you insane because right. it moves so 
quickly. And it's such a, like you said, it's like a total magic hour. And I yeah. think that it's cool to acknowledge those kinds of things, you know? Yeah. Um, and especially in the in the sense of like everything just seems so abstract and kind of ethereal here and kind of otherworldly. A sunset and and clouds and this kind of thing is like a, something to hold on to actually that we can understand. It's a weird. It's a weird thing that happens in reality that is otherworldly, but it's our world. Yeah. So and we see it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, like it, a it grounding helps add the force element too. of fantasy. Yeah. Or, or the fantastical element while while ground like you're saying grounding. Yeah. Exactly. Grounding us in our reality. Yeah. Yeah, just man. a heads up. It looks like we got about twenty minutes left in this. Time I was gonna lapse. say if you wanted to mention something about. Um, well, I don't think you even said like about your podcast. Like this is like your. your oh yeah, podcast. yeah. Thank you. I wanted to thank you for coming <laughs> on and doing this. This is the first time I'm ever doing this. I've been thinking about it for a long time, and uh, I don't even know if it's gonna turn into anything big. Maybe, maybe you know, my podcast won't take off. Maybe it will. Maybe it'll be like I'm the guy who does the podcast now, and like that's me. <laughs> But uh, but I don't I don't even have a name. I'm thinking about calling it short, bald, and angry because I actually like think a, that's perfect. That's that's what I am. That's a ser- <laughs> it's a com- freestyle comic series I'm working on that'll eventually come out. That'll be the title of my next er- copy of Erratica. The book I made, Erratica, is gonna, the next volume is called Short, Bald, and Angry. That's awesome. So yeah, I mean, I, you know, we could talk about all kinds of themes on it. We could talk about me growing up short and be, then later on becoming bald. Two harsh realities I've had to deal with. And, and how, how directly- they contributed to me be, being an angry individual. <laughs> um, and we could talk about anger on it. I don't know, but it's pretty open. Obviously, it's going to be like an art-centric podcast. And I work with so many musicians that I think it'll be obvious I'll bring on like every musician I work with if they're down to come on. Um, I mean, it's cool. I think for, sure. for a lot for musicians, for some people, I think when they look at musicians do what they do, it's like yeah. it's like magic. Like, how do you do that? Yeah. And I think that when I see this kind of thing, it's like exactly the same thing. Like, I feel like this is magic, and nice. um, it's really really cool to see your process. I actually think that, that this is one of the coolest things I would want to see on a podcast is like how the creative flow unveils itself and what is the journey of actual creation. It's, so. it's anguish and pain, just <laughs> hours of like moments where you feel like you got it. It's, it's actually, you go you go through waves like euphoria. It's like, this is, I, I, I understand the universe. I understand everything. And then like cut to an hour later, you're, you're just crying. You're like, I don't know anything. It's like the, the time it. lapse becomes you lighting it on fire. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I actually wanted to take a copy of my book to help promote it and light it on fire. <laughs> and uh, do, a, do a Fahrenheit 451 reference. Yeah. Get like a fire flamethrower and just burn it. There you go. Um, but so yeah, a good Ray Bradbury reference. I think people would appreciate that. I was I was actually going to ask you like, what makes you tick? Because if the theme of if the theme of this is short, bald, and angry, do you, are you you don't strike me as an angry person. You're no, mine like, would be like tall, happy, and hairy. Tall, happy, and hairy. <laughs> the gentle giant. Um, <laughs> Samir is a very tall man. You can't see. You're probably not seeing us right now. I'm very short, and Samir is very tall. Um, I mean, I think that there. The, the process of creation, I think, of being a creative artist, like of seeing how you deal with the rules and parameters that you have, right? But then also how those parameters change a lot of times on the fly, either by maybe a, what would be called a mistake or mm-hmm. not an accident, right? Or or an actual deliberate choice on on the artist's part. And to me, that is fascinating, right? So yeah. so. That's why I like jazz music. That's why I like Indian classical music. Those those are improvisational forms where you you are dealing with data that's like unexpected and new and sort of you have to react and you have to yeah that's, find the path that's the through. best moment if you're not able to not only tap into that but use that well yeah yeah use that and tap into it if you can't do that mm-hmm. then you're just severely limiting your artistic potential that's like an accru- I think that's a crucial lesson to learn as an artist of yeah. any kind yeah to be able to use those mistakes because that is the moment where you're you're actually breaking free and it's always going to be you. you you should you should ru- you need to run with it exactly i mean that's where i think you find you yeah um it's it's you have to be able to take that leap and say you know what even though maybe everything feels wrong you still have to go forward. Yeah. And so, like, how are you going to find a way to step forward um, in a way that matters and, yeah. is, and is still important and worth it, you know? And I think that a lot of artists struggle with that kind of thing. A lot of artists um, have to make a lot of compromises in their lives, and I think that it gets um, very discouraging for some of them. But I also think that when you have those opportunities to, like, you know, 
just dive deep and be free and and make your stuff and put it out there and stamp it with your name and say this is what I stand behind that is like the that those are the moments that you have to sort of strive for you ever have moments where you're just like maybe it's at when it's finally done or like about to be done where you're just crying maybe alone like tears of joy records are like that for me like this last record took over two years to make it yeah it's and a monumental I, undertaking yeah and I mean there's just so many emotions by the end I think that towards the end I just I hate it I hate it so well, much that of course yeah, yeah and then and then maybe like um, and then I won't want to hear it for like a month or two or three and then I'll come back to it and and it will be like it'll be like amazing feeling you know you'll you'll forget all those things that you hated <laughs> I, I personally one of my favorite experiences in life is when I'm crying tears of joy especially when it has to do with art yeah. and especially when it's a collaborative thing and there's lots of people involved yeah but even if it's just something I did myself it just feels great it's like yeah, you 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 just struggled through years of your life, you know, overcame all kinds of hard hardships and whatever 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 the hell was going on in your life at that time. Yeah. To do this and and it's like this. I don't I don't like bragging about the courage too much, but it, but you know it's like it takes it takes a lot of bravery to put your art out into the world. People are yeah. harsh as fuck. People people are brutal out there. Totally. Like really insensitive as to like. Like, there's one thing if someone's giving you creative feedback and, or, and you know, constructive criticism, but people yeah. can just be assholes. Yeah. And I think that's what discourages a lot of people, too. It's just like they get, someone says something and it breaks them and yeah. they're just done. Yeah, you got to have a really thick skin. And I think you also have to realize that, uh, you know, you see something. Right? It's like, that's only on you mm -hmm. to, to, to get that out. And putting it out there is actually alone is... Just the gesture of even trying to put that out there yeah. is something to we should all be grateful for. You know what I mean? It's like this is this is a it's a responsibility that artists feel. It's a compulsion to like to express this thing. And I think that I, I never feel their responsibility. Uh -huh. I have pure compulsion yeah. and just personal desire. And then at the end, I realize people appreciate it. So there is, yeah. but I actually that's not true. Maybe I have been feeling the responsibility that I've been feeling is especially with the video work I've been doing. I had uh -huh. this. I kind of wish I made more film at a younger age when I just didn't give a fuck and I was rebellious. Right. You know, like, I wish I got that out because now I'm 35 and the things I did when I was, I wanted to do when I was younger, I can't just do. I can't just be that rebellious kid anymore. I need to, like, overthink everything. Like, what is this saying? <laughs> what does it mean? And am I going to hurt people with this meaning? Sure. Or am I going to help people with this meaning? And that's really when important. When you're a kid, you now. can get away with that. Yeah, I wish I just did the offensive things that I, that I kind of <laughs> want to do now when I was a kid and didn't think about it. Now I have to think about it and make sure. it really mean something. It hurts. Yeah. Well, but, I think that is the responsibility. Yeah, we do have a um, responsibility. We really yeah. do. I think, it's, I mean, that's just part of, you know, I mean, like, I think that it's great to see my, my child, uh, like, make art or whatever she's doing. And I'm just like, wow, you are just crazy. Like, you're, you're a crazy person that you can even think that this is, like, how, you, how things work. Like, you it's know, inspiring, she, right? Yeah, it's very inspiring. I mean, it's like, it's like a child's mind is so liberated. Um, and I think that as we get older, we, we realize what the power of it is. You know what I mean? It's like, art is extremely powerful. It, it is like a weapon. Um, and I think that yeah. when when it's used in a way by a conscientious mind, by like someone who really knows what the weapon is, it can be it can very fight dangerous. Fascism, yeah, or it can be yeah negative, and it can fight uh, evils too. But I think that it is it is like powerful, and I think that you have to be ready to take on the responsibility. People who aren't willing to do that, a lot of times they don't even consider the impact of their art. Sometimes I don't know if it applies so much to the music you make necessarily but it definitely applies to like rap music or, or uh, films for sure mm -hmm. like you might have great intentions but someone out there is just gonna see it and they could misinterpret it and take it like the wrong way totally and like I hate to say it but we'll get a gun or something and just mm -hmm. misinterpret the entire meaning no, and do definitely. something crazy it's like that's not what we're saying here you know? yeah and I think that it's also important to think about the responsibility socially right yeah. like that's the thing it's not like um, it's not like the art gods are gonna judge you like, you know, it's like what's going to happen is that you are going to feel so free and so liberated. You're going to forget about the possible impact this could have on society. Right. Yeah. So like like, for example, the previous poster we made, the only I showed it to a lot of women. Yeah. Were, were, yeah. Were there criticisms? Because the only didn't... criticism was the size of the of the goddess's breasts. Yeah. OK. And I was like, well, that's interesting. So like and, and that was cool. I was like, OK, I wanted to hear that because I in the back of my head, I was like, I think her breasts are a little large. But I also know that. 
Indian baby statues notoriously have oversized breasts. Yeah, I mean, and so it's I'll, like I, I would love to draw the gamut of of uh, not just humanity but everything. Like I want to draw everything. That was yeah. one poster. I thought you were going to say you want to draw the gram gamut of breast sizes. I do. <laughs> I totally do. I mean, my book is named Erotica, so there's like a whole erotic element I haven't really been showing in my art online. I've seen some recent streams where you like you have like a there's even like more. A, there's more, and I'm, I yeah. intend to go places that that I probably won't share on social yeah, media. Well, that's just, fine. Or maybe I will. I don't know. <laughs> I've been thinking about it, the responsibility. Yeah. You know, I I work with kids sometimes, and I'm like, with Instagram, they could easily find me. Like, mm -hmm. and that's weird. Like, yeah. I, I would I would feel very uncomfortable if the kids I'm working with go on and see these weird drawings I'm doing. I, sure. I'm not cool with that. Uh huh. And I don't think their parents would be either. Yeah. So it's it's just like weird, awkward thing. But I, I I'm very determined to make sure I make adult art. I don't want to fall like I want to make art for kids too. Yeah. And I want I and I, I know like when I was a kid I was looking at a lot of art adult art when I was yeah. probably too young to even be looking at it. And that's right. the thing that happens. Kids go out, they find things, they're gonna totally. get past the parents no matter what. Yeah. But yeah, I don't, I don't want to fall into this realm where I'm like censoring myself ever right. unless there's like a really good reason, you know? Yeah. Uh, there needs to be reason behind everything, obviously. Yeah, definitely. And I think that in the end, you have to be able to reflect that in your work, too. You know, it's if, like, you know, Frank Zappa, for example. Like, yeah. He just, like, he has such strong political views in his music. Mm -hmm. And his music is this rebellious music. And it's, like, breaking out of so many conventions. Um, and he saw it as a social responsibility, I think. You know, it wasn't like the song itself was the responsibility. It was, like, his, the impact and the social commentary. So, like the function of censorship on visual art, like what you're saying, that is what you are, you're, you're taking on responsibility in a way to undermine an attempt to try and censor your, you know, you, or to say that it's okay to censor this kind of thing. Right. Even for kids, I actually think it's like, I wouldn't say your work is like, uh, it's like, it's borderline a little bit. Sometimes it's like, wow, that's a kind of disturbing image, but I don't feel like traumatized by it. Well, I don't feel well, like then it. I'm not doing enough. <laughs> <laughs> I need to take it. To I mean, the next I, level. I, pr I probably have like <laughs> maybe more of a palette for for some yeah. you know out there stuff. No, I think I think we're so saturated. The culture so saturated with disturbing stuff. It's like I'd be surprised if anybody is ever disturbed by anything I do. I like, mean, I think if if you had like okay, for example, I think there's plenty of people who are just insensitive to like what what could offend somebody right and it's not even about it being grotesque or you know visually disturbing like it's like something is being said or reflected right. by this work you know um unintentionally or saying. or even if it is intentional like they don't realize how offensive yeah it is. they don't necessarily realize like what it what is the like effect that that is that is made on a person maybe and it's not even about like this one person's thing it's just if you are going to do that you have to be prepared to take on the responsibility of of having that conversation with that person, you know? Yeah. Like if we had a line of Native American people, you know, in the Trail of Tears or something in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like... Very dangerous territory. Yeah, it's see. dangerous territory. A, but white, it, a white man and an Indian man, but not Native American man. Exactly. Yeah, we, Native Americans especially, like, have been so... Yeah, I know you're all about preserving culture and making sure like standing up for them and dealing with so, it yeah. so fucked with so hard and that's what this album is about too it's like it's about actually embracing our history right mm -hmm. it's about like not not just disregarding something as like this happened such a long time ago that's not something i did i didn't have slaves you know right. i didn't like you know it wasn't I, me I, it wasn't my fault right. right or like i'm not sexist or something but like maybe the fact is is like unbeknownst to you like your actions are steeped in the history where this is what's going on i so. think we all have a social responsibility whether we are or aren't those things to mm -hmm. to help raise awareness be conscious help other people become more conscious about it right because That's we are a very insensitive harsh cruel culture and it's like we don't need more of that we need we need more openness and more connectivity and less exactly. div divisiveness and i think when you asked earlier like what makes me tick i think i think that's been lately what has made me tick it's it's being able to appreciate the connection between the past, the present, and the future. To be able to see that we actually have been kind of we are extensions from this history, um, oppression, you know, war, all these things are part of our DNA now. You know, yeah. it's like it doesn't matter if if I have not oppressed someone or not. That's my legacy. That's part of being a human now. Right. And so. We have to own that, and that means we have to be able to learn from it, and we actually have to be able to like go past that. We have to be able to reflect and better ourselves 
And unfortunately, the cycle is still repeating itself in certain parts of the planet. So. Exactly. And if and I think about it more and more, and even in uh, indigenous native Hawaiian culture, they, there's a lot of talk about um, circles and how time is a circle and we are part of that circle. And essentially, once you start to perceive that, you see how uh, everyone has actually been through everyone else's experiences at some point or the other. And there is a cyclical connection that's constantly unfolding at many, many levels. Yeah. Um, even when you look at the the lava that's been pouring out of uh, Hawaii, you know, all the damage that's been done by yeah. the volcanic stuff. I've uh, heard from a couple of my, my Hawaiian friends, and, and there is not a sense of uh, fear or, or... Well, they respect... The, they respect the, the earth and, and it's also it's also we can never understand. yeah and i think that there's a there's a feeling of that this is uh the earth essentially recreating itself i think i heard circle. my roommate listening to something where they were there's engineers trying to like pump water into it to cool it down to help stop it and it's like is that a good is it a good <laughs> thing if we stop the volcano i don't think it is i think we need to let those things the earth needs to get out the steam and yeah to- i mean it's a it seems like we don't really think like it's like sometimes we as humans i guess think that like everything is our responsibility and we should just like kind of make everything conform. and we're very short-sighted we yeah we just we're always trying to make profit in the moment or stop a problem in the moment without thinking of any of the repercussions that's right? exactly right yeah and it's kind of like we need everything to conform to our world view and, right. and i think that when it comes to seeing that like the earth regenerate itself like in those volcanic activities i do really feel like this is that circle you know what I mean? Like this is some, and I think that when I see my my friends in Hawaii and they talk about this, it's that's what they're reflecting on. They're reflecting on the the cyclical nature of this and how houses and swimming pools and tennis courts, that shit's all totally temporary in the Very long temporary. term. Very temporary. This planet, yeah, we we know we're not gonna outlive this Earth. This Earth is gonna outlive us unless we create some crazy bomb that blows it up. <laughs> I think we need to put a volcano if we if we do another piece together. No pressure. Yeah. Uh, volcano should definitely be in there. Well, we talked about doing a third one, and uh, I'm definitely into it. I'm actually thinking I'll probably do a third record in this run. So, like, my first record before this was uh, Namaskar, which okay. was also talking on this, like, Indian and um, American sort of, you know, hybrid life as a musician. And then this one, um, Circle Has No Beginning, it's definitely much more refined, and it's much more kind of uh, about the individual people coming together. And this third one... I have to still think about it, but I think that'll probably be like the last chapter in this sort of um, crossing over between the traditional musics. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I think the volcano idea is a great idea. Something where we really do uh, show how the Earth, maybe alone, is a cyclical force. Right. And and people and humanity and, and uh, life forms are really not needed necessarily i know in one of the thumbnails because i did i did a thumbnail for all, all three posters early on and i had some cyclones in them uh-huh and uh have you ever seen videos of those like fire cyclones oh my that's God. insane yeah. i thought that would that was just some kind of fantasy idea but that's a real, a real thing that real can happen. occurrences it happens i think like it's probably forest fires or something i think before, it could probably happen there yeah, yeah. i uh-huh. think i think what'll happen is uh the the tornado will go over like a big tank and create a fire uh-huh. explosion goes up in the thing too but once it gets going then it's just then it's going right it's scary as hell wow that that's like hell on earth mm-hmm. um we're almost we're almost done here i feel like we're going to run out of time but i did want to ask you one quite one question i yeah. didn't really get to any of these questions actually <laughs> um you're a dad yeah and uh i i'm super stressed out now with a puppy she's ruined my life uh-huh. makes getting anything done very hard yeah and uh time management has become a real problem for me and i i'm and I'm doing, I'm, my dreams are the same. I want to do everything. I, I want to do everything that I've ever wanted to do now more than ever. Yeah. So I'm, I guess I want to know, like, how do you, is, are there any tricks to managing your time as a dad and, and <laughs> the art and everything and your, you know, husband as well? Um, I mean, I think that you have to find those times. I guess well, once I became a dad, I think I was really, I had to find those moments during the day. I mean, I definitely, like, I couldn't, I couldn't not have some time for working on this every day. I needed to have every day something. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that I quickly realized that because like in the process of having a kid in the first six months or a year, you're just total sleep deprived. You can't like do anything else for the most part. And I could see how like my my mentality was like really being affected. Like I would just yeah. be like really annoyed all day. And then like all I needed to do was really just get behind my, my instrument and really yeah. practice, you know. Yeah, we, um, need, we need it. We need it. And I think that that was uh, something where I had to be able to say, okay, 
objectively here, it's not like what I want. What do I need? You know, I need an hour or two every day. I need it in the early part of the day so that if because if I start on my computer, I'm going to be stuck on my computer for a long time. So before I get on my computer, I need to have a moment. If it's 30 minutes, 40 minutes, whatever, of just creative time, time to free myself, free my mind in the morning. Yeah. And then in the nighttime before I go to sleep, everything in between can be up for grabs. It can be crazy. My daughter got a bloody nose. I have to go get her from school. Like whatever, you know, like. And and then at the end of the day, it's like when it's when she's done, it's quiet. Then I'm in there, and then it's like you just sleep less. <laughs> I guess yeah. that's kind of the thing. Like it's like I actually, you know, if I can go to bed before eleven or midnight, I'm pretty psyched. And even then, it's like getting up at six. You don't have any like tools or apps or tricks like that that you can recommend? Uh, not really. I just I think honestly, we don't need as much sleep as we think we need. If that's nice. I think the key. That used to be my motto: never sleep. And I used to. I, I'm notorious. I think some of my friends still think I don't sleep. But yeah, the last couple of years of my life, I can't do it anymore. I'm just. I need. I need the seven to eight hours. And yeah. So it's really hurting me to to have this puppy. Yeah. So the moral of the story is: you don't need sleep, <laughs> and don't get a puppy. But if you're gonna have a kid, just plan on not sleeping for like two years. Yeah, I mean, I definitely <laughs> think a puppy is probably harder than a kid in this regard because. Now I can, I totally, my daughter is like very self-sufficient. Yeah. So I can just be like, okay, like read your books, chill. I'm going to go. Well, in the long run, humans become smart, but it takes humans longer to grow up. Yeah. But puppies are just the absolute worst. They're the biggest nightmare. (laughs) There's a common misconception that they're cute. Yeah. But they're, but then there's a, there's a lesser known, uh, but, but known reality. The cuter they are, the crazier they are. Uh Uh-huh. So yeah. (laughs) All right. I feel like we've, we've. This isn't necessarily the note I wanted to end on, but this has been a great, a great talk, man. Thank you. I really you, appreciate you coming over and hanging out in the studio. Man, thank you for doing this work, man. It's You're awesome. always welcome here, man. And, and uh, even if this doesn't blow up, I'm going to do more of it. Cool. So we'll do more of this in the future. Let's do it, man. Cool, man. Thank you, bro. Peace. Best of luck. Yeah. Likewise. Wow. If you just listened to that entire thing, thank you so much. This has been a special moment in my life, and uh, thank you again to Samir, and. Click that. Click those links in the description below. Check out all his music. Check out his tour if you're on the West Coast. And uh, please consider donating to my Patreon. Until next time, adios.